control system. And we say there are two types of uh, control structure. The first one is the second one is closed So for open loop, I got my controller, I got my plane, and this is my output. Okay, so you can see that the controller cannot sense anything from the output because after this one generates control command, it goes to the plane directly, and the plane is going to uh, react based on how much you get the input. For a closed loop system, it's going to be a little bit different. Instead of sending out a signal directly, I have a sensor. So, the control command over here is going to depending on the difference between input and output, which means we are determining our controller, uh, we are called control signal based on the error. So if this error is zero, steady state e uh, error equals to zero, then I don't generate any output because it has achieved its goal. So we, our controller might start over here. So those two are the basic uh, start we have over here. So What's the benefit of this one and what's bad of this one? Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's decide the advantages first. So for open loop, clearly, we do not have a sensor. If you guys have ever used any type of uh, remote control, if you need to use sensor, sometimes if you want to decide, maybe it's ultrasonic, maybe it's infrared, you need to spend like 10, 20 bucks to buy the sensors. If you are generating a medium, let's say you are fast time, and you need to generate a, a, a robot, and it's going to be one million pieces. And each one has a sensor that costs you about $100. It means one <coughs> million. So obviously, if it's overlooked, you don't need to have sensor. And also, if you say, if you know that your motor is stable, right? If it's stable, then it's stable. You say it's going to. Be you, you turn on the, 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 the power supply and it's going to generate 5 volt and you know 5 volt is going to rotate at that speed. It's not going to change anything. Then, it means that it's going to be inherently stable. Okay, but what's the benefit of using closed loop control? The major benefit of closed loop control is that, okay, I see what's going on from the output, which means I got the opportunity to fine tune my system so the error can be reduced. That's a major benefit, and that is everything we need to learn in this class. got an advantage, certainly we got some kind of disadvantage or drawback. So what is the drawback of open loop control? Obviously, I don't know anything about output, which means if I got some error, I cannot, I have nothing to do, I can not do anything about it. So the main, one of the major thing is, it's difficult to <coughs> achieve precise And one 
another drawback is that okay, I got the drawback. <clears throat> The robot in the water. So I asked this robot to be at this position. And if this open loop control, you just turn on the knob, and this robot is going to move from one position to another. That's ideal, right? Unfortunately, my daughter is here. And she's five years old. Oh, it's a robot. It's interesting. I want to play with that. So I give a push. Since you don't have any sensor to sense something like that, what happens? It will be pushed to this position and keep on moving. So eventually, it might stop right here, and you got some kind of disturb. You, you got some error between this position and this position. So when you have open loop control and you got disturbance, you cannot do anything about it because you don't have any uh, feedback. So when you have disturbance. You cannot do anything. Also, let's not say I have a, I have a daughter over here. So I told my daughter, okay, that's not bad. That's pretty bad. So stay away and just keep everything over here. Keep your position over here. However, I got an, I got another thing. I got a cat. I got two cats, and one is pretty fat. So she dis she decide. She wants us. She wants us sleep over here. And this robot come here and tip over. That is a noise or is a disturbance, and that's uncertain because my cat obviously do not understand what I'm talking about. Right? So when I told her, okay, that's bad cat. Please do not stay over here. If it's a dog, probably it won't stay here, but it's a cat. Everybody knows that. <laughs> so when we have a cat, that's my uncertainty. Uncertain system. So if we got some kind of un something uncertain, we have nothing to do with that. So if you got disturbance, you got uncertainty in your system. Open the control certainly cannot compensate for those kind of things. So that is something we need to deal with with control uh, feedback control theory. Okay. However, when you design your controller, you also have some kind of uh, drawback. For instance, I believe most of you guys have this kind of experience. You got a speaker. You got your amplifier, and this amplifier is used for <coughs> microphone. Okay, so if you this thing is far away from your speaker, then the speaker is going to generate sound. What you expect? But if you move this thing close to this one, what happens? This one has some kind of uh, beeping sound generating up. That's positive feedback. And when you have something like that, it means your system becomes unstable. Because unsta unstability, instability means that you your uh, output is going to go to infinite, and you have nothing to do with that. So if you get close to control, one of the things you're going to encounter is if you do not have correct controller design, your system may be unstable. That's one of the uh, most important things. We need to have our system to be stable. Second thing is, compared to this one, based on the block diagram, we call this kind of diagram, block diagram. Obviously, we got another block over here. So this block means money. So one of the major drawback is need for cost <coughs> Okay, so this is a drawback. Those two are the drawback for our uh, uh, closed loop control system. And sometimes this can be a major problem because even though you are using some kind of sensor, but the sensor is not good enough. 
sometimes it will lead into unstable. So when you try to design your control system, you need to get a you need to get a balance because you can suddenly say, okay, hi boss, I uh I, I know how to get everything pretty pretty precise and it's stable, but the sensor is close, going to cost you twenty thousand dollars. And the other guy say, okay, I don't I, I won't be able to do that stable, but I can get close enough. Then here is Taiwan, and you, when you say you need to have twenty thousand dollars for a sensor, and you need to generate like one million pieces, what happened? You're fired. So you're an engineer. That is something you guys are going to encounter in the future. So be sure you understand what's going on and what is an advantage and what is a disadvantage. Okay. So those things are something you might need to know. So the next thing we're going to talk about is control procedure, controller design procedure. So when we need to design the controller, what are we going to do? This is my closed loop system, and this is the control scheme that we're going to deal with for the rest of the semester. So obviously, we need to know how to deal with sensor. I, I need to know how to design the controller, and everything are going to be mathematics. Okay. So since everything are mathematics, before you can put the equation over here, what do you need to know? You need to know what is the mathematic equation you're going to deal with over here, right? So if you do not know what's going on over here, suddenly you have no idea what kind of equation you have and how the system is going to behave. So the first thing we need to do, we need to do is to understand the system or we want to do the model. Once we get our modeling, we need to know dynamic response, like how to make everything unstable, how to uh, how fast the system is going to achieve my goal. And if I get everything to, uh, if I generate my control format over here, whether my actuator is going to be saturated or is going to have enough power to drive this thing. Those are the things you need to uh, deal with, and those are included in the dynamic responses. And once those are down, then you start to do the controller design. Okay. Then the rest is going to be analyzed whether it's the, syst the system is going to be stable. And the other thing is whether the system is with is fast enough. Those kind of things. We're going to talk about this in topic five. Start to talk about those things in topic five. Okay, but before we talk about controller design, we need to understand how your system is going to look like. And this part is going to be in the first test. Okay. Any questions so far? If not, then we're going to talk about topic two. Okay, if you, I noticed that not everybody attended the class last time, you may just add this course. So if you are attending this course for the first time, please go to ILMS, download the notes. Everything has been posted. I'm going to um, uh, post a video of what I'm talking about right now on YouTube. So if you have problem understanding what I'm talking about because my accent is weird and you don't understand what I'm talking about, just, just go online and, and take a look.
So we're going to talk about this is topic two. System modeling. We spoke about we need to understand the system. So in other words, we've got the physical system like you have a car, you have a robot, you have something you need to uh, determine its position, temperature, uh, velocity, anything. Before we can start to design our controller, we need to know the system response or system equation or system dynamics. <laughs> Normally, if you are going to graduate school, we are calling it system dynamics. <coughs> Sometimes you will say the transfer function. Okay, so depending on which kind of system you're going to deal with, you have different methods to get your system model. The first thing we're going to talk about is mechanical system. This is something you learn in uh, dynamics. We are start from equation uh, motion. Anybody still remember how to get this thing? Raise your hand. Okay. Not too many people out there that remember what's going on. So, let me ask another question. Do you guys still remember Newton's second law? What is Newton's second law? Right, very good. So, this is actually F equals to MA. Okay, but when we are doing dealing with modeling, we do not use acceleration. Because acceleration is kind of like a, a physical property. But when we are dealing with system dynamics, we are dealing with differential equations. A is a second derivative of position. So instead of using MA, it's going to be M as double dot. Now, when we say it's a force, you might think, OK, this is an external force. That's correct. But in addition to external forces, is there anything that is, your, that is going to generate force? It might be pulled back. It might be pulled, pulled to some, somewhere else. It might be something to prevent your system from, from starting. So what kind of force you guys can think of when you are dealing with dynamics? The first one I can give you one example is strain, book stop. So when you have You might have what is Cook's law? F equals to one. Okay. So this is not the derivative. This is second derivative, and this is going to be on this side because it's poles. And you have what? Very good. Normally, the force, let's, let's say this is square, this is square. This is what? Related to velocity. So, normally, we're going to model everything using those three components. One is your mass, one is your spring, and the other one is density, which is normal. For instance, you've got a robotic arm. So you're going to model this guy. You guys recognize this thing? Yeah. Like uh, 30 years ago, when I was a kid. <laughs> it might be too old to use. But if you try to model the part over here, and when you start to move, it's a mass. But you also notice that when you give a force or a torque to move this one thing up, you also encounter some kind of resistance, because 
if, if this if the friction is zero, you can pull everything freely. But obviously, it's not the case, right? So when we are modeling this thing, you've got a spring. You got a spring. Okay, say that. Also, because you pull it down, you won't you won't be something like this. It will be gradually so down, so you got another C theta stuff. So you put force on one side. This part including three terms. One is external force, the other one is spring, and one is uh, caused by the speed. On the other side, let's do the second one. Okay? Supposedly, you should have a one course related to modeling itself. But uh, in most of the universities in Taiwan, we don't have those kind of things. So it will be only one chapter in control systems. That is something we're going to talk about. And please, if you don't understand something I'm talking about, ask me. Okay? So when we are doing those kind of things for a mechanical system, we got inertia. That is my mass. Okay. We got Related to x dot. This is x dot dot. We got velocity, elasticity. Related to x. And we use component k. K. We use c or b sometimes. And there are two types. One is Okay, so one side I use x double dot, x dot, and x. But on the other side, I'm using theta double dot, theta dot, and theta. Okay, so depending on what kind of uh, uh, motion you're going to have, you're going to have two types of equations. One, x equals to ma, and x double dot. That is the other one is T equals to I theta double dot. That's torque. Though the theory or the physics law behind those two equations are the same, but depending on which kind of properties you're talking about, you need to have two separate equations. Does it make sense? Okay. Uh, in your notes, I have listed something like. Like this. So if we want to do the modeling for this guy, what are we going to do? We still, obviously, this one's a linear, linear movement, right? So we're going to use this set of equation. What are we going to do? Step one. <coughs> Identify. All right. Why is that? Because we need to have a reference telling us which direction is positive, which direction is negative. So if I have a sign, this sign as my positive direction, which should make sense because normally which sign is going to be positive when you are right when you are learning your mathematics? Right hand side, right? So this is going to be my positive. So since I get the one down. The second thing is three body diagram. I believe you guys learn a lot of those kind of things in dynamics. If you don't know what's going on over here, I bet your dynamics is in big problem. Right? So 
we need to draw our free line diagram. Since this is put on the table, so certainly I got mg, I got normal force. But those two are not something we worry about. Sometimes you can just ignore that because this object over here obviously is not moving up and down. Right? So those two, you don't need to put any equation over here. However, the other three components, uh, four components, force, mass, K, and the spring, you need to. Sorry. It should be C and K. Okay. Those things you need to put over here. I got my force over here, and that's tall to my right hand side. So the mass over here is going to have a, some kind of tendency to move to this direction, right? Because my force is in this direction, which means it's moving to this direction. So when this one is moving to this direction, what happened to the K? Let's deal with the K first. Is the K going to be extended or is it going to be compressed? Extended. extended. So when it's extended, what kind of force is going to generate? Pull it back, right? So when it's pulled back, it's going to be in this direction. Why is pulled strong? Chaos. So the force is going to be something like this. When this one is moving to this direction, this is a dash part. And this one is moving, certainly it's going to have some kind of velocity. When this one has velocity, what is the force going to be generated? Here. CX star. Which direction? Left hand side or right hand side? Left, Left hand side. Good. Okay, so that's free body diagram. Then the next step is <coughs> equation of motion. <coughs> then which is pretty straightforward. I know on the other side, it must be <coughs> mx double dot. You need to put force on one side and put x, x, mx double dot on the other side. So my force, this is going to be positive. This is going to be negative. This is going to be negative. This one equals to mx double dot. Is this my system dynamics? No. Because when you say you are dealing with system dynamics, you need to put, when we are dealing with we are dealing with a relationship between output and input, then the mathematical equation over here. So this one over here is equation of motion. That's perfectly correct. But since we are dealing with system dynamics, we need to put input on one side, output on the other side. So tell me, based on this configuration over here, what is your output? What is your input and what is your output? When I say input, it's something you can control. F is my input. What is my output? Over here, which variable is your, your output? You only have one variable. I'm talking about single input, single output. So what is your output? X double dot. X. So X double dot, X dot is just a direct time derivative of X. So as long as you know X, you certainly know this one and this one. Does it make sense? So X is going to be your output. F is going to be your input. Put <coughs> input on one side, X on the other side. Which makes this one? This is my input. This is my output. Does it make sense? Any questions so far? Is that straightforward? Everybody understand what I'm talking about? Other than input. Should be pretty straightforward. Okay. So once this one is done, then you move to the uh, third chapter. Next one we're going to do the function. Using the plus principle. 
Okay, you guys still remember how to build this thing? If you 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 don't quite remember, it's okay because we're going to review this one. But over here, I'm just give you some kind of hint, heads up. This is um, x double dot. So this means s square. This is x dot. It means s. This one has no derivative, so we leave it just like this. And this one is just f. So after Laplace transform, you are going to have m s square x of s plus c s x of s plus k x of s equals to f of s. s over here is a derivative term. You, de uh, you differentiate this two times, then you got squared. You differentiate this term for one time, you got one s. You do not di di uh, differentiate anything over here, so there is no s. Put everything all together. You get something like this. Then you put output over input. As we agree, x, x of s is my output, f of s is my input. This is my transfer functions. Okay. So the goal for this chapter and uh, for this topic and topic three is to get the transfer function, which means I would like to know what's the what's the relationship between output and input. That's something we're going to talk about for uh, this topic and next topic. Question? Am I going too fast? Or is it okay, everybody? Which one? Pass up. Oh, this is capital X. This is X. This is X. When you do Laplace transform, sometimes we just put something like this. Okay, it's still x, big x, small x. Okay. Any question? Essentially, what, what we're trying to do is, I won't do the Laplace transform for this part, but I need to find out something like this. Okay, so we need to do a little bit modeling before we start. Right. So, since I know what I'm going to do, I'm going to identify my direction. So clearly, every 
everything is moving in this direction, so I would prefer to do something like this, x and y. I want to have this direction as my positive, it's because it's moving downward. If you use this one as positive, it's, it's okay. But everything, you've got negative sign in front of it. Sometimes it's not a good idea. Okay, so that's something we're going to use. After you have the coordinate system designed, the next thing is we want to do three body diagram. So again, just want to say, yeah. How many forces we're talking about over here? One force or two force? One. Which one? Then G. Very good. Where is it located? At the tip or at G? In G. Good. So I got my MG over here. Anything else? I know this is going to be on the head. Right. The next thing we're going to do is equation of motion. Tell me, should I use F equals to MA or T equals to IR? Should we use force equation or we should use force equation? Force. Force, because it's rotational movement. So we use, or we use theta instead of X. This is pretty straightforward because I only have one force and it's going to be related to this position. And when we do something like this, this must be perpendicular to the moment arm, right? So the moment arm in this case is going to be L over 2 sine theta. And I'll have um, mg force multiplied by moment arm equals to my force. Is this positive or negative? Positive. Negative. I don't care, just give me the points. <laughs> this is negative. Use your right hand rule. It's going to be rotated this way and it's pointing into the platform. So it's going to be negative. If it's this direction, then it's positive. This is dynamics, okay? So it's going to be negative. We've only got one torque related to this three by diagram, and this is the one. What do I put on the other side? I alpha, right? Yes. What is my I? This is into this point. So if you look into your textbook of dynamic statics, uh, uh, mechanical material, you're going to find out this one is going to be one third ML squared. I'm not going to use alpha, I'm going to use say the double down. So if we put everything all together, I'll have my straightforward, right? So this one over here is going to be your equation of motion. The next question I'll have for you guys, don't worry, I won't talk about this in uh, other university, but uh, since you are here, let me ask you a question. Is this equation a linear one or this is nonlinear? Do you guys remember what is linear or is nonlinear? You guys learned this in engineering mathematics. When you are a linear when you have a linear system you can do superposition. Do you guys remember superposition? No? Okay. <laughs> superposition means that if you have two systems, they are both linear. You can add response to the other response, and it will be the same if you model them together. Okay? But if you have theta and you have sine theta over here, triangular equation is not linear equation. When you see sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, that's not linear. 
when we when you guys are learning everything in undergraduate study, you don't deal with nonlinear systems. Nonlinear systems belong to graduate school. So everything we deal with it must be linear system, which means this one over here is not linear. Uh -huh. If you want to make everything linear, uh -huh. you need to say, okay, uh -huh. theta is small. When theta is small, what is the definition of theta? Theta is small, x is equal to theta. Okay? So those are the things you need to know when theta is small and sine theta is going to be equal to theta. Which means the system becomes linear. So when we are dealing with pendulum, normally it's going to be a nonlinear system. But when I ask you to solve for the control system for a pendulum, you need to make this assumption. Or in other words, if you encounter something, you have sine or sine tangent, those kind of terms in your system, and I ask you to solve for the uh, output, you always need to assume the theta is small. So you can assume everything is linear. When theta is small, there are two things you're going to find out. Sine theta equals to theta because theta is small. Cosine theta equals to what? If cosine is zero degree, what happens? So that is how you linearize a system. This is not this is not the perfect way of doing everything. But for a control system, that's really fine. If you are dealing with vibration, there is another uh, path we can deal with using uh, Taylor series expansion. We can also deal with those kinds of stuff. But that's another. Any questions so far? Is that clear? Everybody understand what I'm talking about? So far, we're talking about single object. I probably won't be able to finish everything over here, but let's that's, that's try to go as far as we can do. So second example, the following figure demonstrates the configuration of an automobile suspension system. Write the equation of motion of one quarter of the car mass of the wheel, assume that the model for the car is uh, with a mass 1,580 kilograms, including the four wheels, which has a mass of 20 kilograms each, whatever that is. The important thing is, you, get, you see there are two mass over here, and you've got the, some kind of venting and some screw <coughs> over here. So you, when you guys see this kind of stuff, what are you going to do? So I got the suspension system over here, and obviously when you sit in the car, you're going to feel something moving up and down. So the input over here is going to be your arm, right? The profile of the road is going to be your input. The output, which one is your output, y or x? Y. 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 Because you are sitting over here, you are, you are not sitting on the wheel. 
unless you are in circuits, otherwise you don't sit on the wheel, correct? Right? So this is going to be your output. So the goal for this specific <coughs> problem is to find out the relationship between Y and R. Okay? So we are given a suspension system. Try to find y of s over r of s. This is my output. This is my input. We'll start from differential equation and talk about this part. I'm going to give you guys some kind of heads up over here and doing those kind of stuff. Okay. So before we can write down our equation of motion, what do we need to do? Free body diagram. Based on this configuration, how many free body diagonals you need to draw? One or two? Two. Two. One for this one and the other one for this one. So after the free body diagram, I'll let you guys go. So those are the directions it's going to move up and down. And those are the position variables we're going to deal with. So for now, for the M over here, let's assume Y greater than X, which means y, the movement of Y is going to be greater than X. You're going to notice there nothing different, but let's assume this one at this moment. So over here, since this one is moving not, uh, longer than this one, so the spring over here is going to be extended. When it's going to be extended, what kind of force you're going to encounter from the spring? Downward or upward? Downward. downward. What is the force? K, Y minus X. What is your force from the damper? It's going to be the same. B, Y dot minus X dot. So this is a equation of motion for my first object, for, uh, for M2. For this one, what kind of force you're going to have for the spring and for the damping over here? Newton's third law. If you have a force on both, uh, applied to a single object, the force on one side must be the same force on the other side. Opposite direction, but the same magnitude. Right? Still remember, this is physics. So when I draw uh, the free body diagram, I have k, x minus y, b, x dot, minus y dot. Is this everything, or do I still miss anything? This one, right? So when this one is moving upward, what kind of force you're going to have for the spring over here, downward, right? Because this one is going to be expensive. So the force over here is going to be <coughs> KW1. Is this one X or? Huh? Minus, Minus R. Keep in mind, R is my input. No matter what you do, you must have your input included in your free body diagram, otherwise, your input does not affect anything. Does it make sense? This is the last thing we're going to deal with today because I think I'm out of time. We're going to talk about how to generate the equation of motion <coughs> over here. Then we're going to deal with Laplace transform and do a little bit algebra to find out the relationship between y of s and r of s. This is something we're going to deal with Monday. Any questions before I let you guys go?